Good afternoon, everyone. We just finished our governor's call with the White House, and uh, there wasn't a lot of new information, um, but here's what they had to say. Uh, there will be no changes in allotment this week, but again, supply exceeds demand uh, at this uh, point in time. Several governors uh, pressed the FDA on a timeline on Pfizer's transition from emergency approval to full approval as they have completed their application. But unfortunately, uh, the FDA wasn't able to give any information on that uh, process at all. Uh, they also said that as a country, we've hit 70% of those over 30. Uh, which is different than their original goal of 70% for those over 18 by the 4th. Uh, for reference, if we use that metric, we would be at 85.3%. Lastly, it was General Perna's last call today as he's retiring, uh, starting under President Trump and continuing under President Biden. General Perna, a four-star general, has waged a war he never envisioned he was put in charge of managing vaccine supply under an incredibly difficult situation and did a remarkable job. He's a perfect example of how to rise above politics and focusing on getting the job done for the American people. And I, for one, want to thank him for his incredible work and uh, service. Uh, moving on, uh, yesterday was a symbolic milestone in our pandemic response. The final pieces of our med medical surge site at the Champlain Valley Exposition were removed and the space was turned back uh, to the fairgrounds. I want to thank the National Guard and the State Emergency Response Team for their quick work building the surge site last year and keeping it ready at a moment's notice ever since. I also want to thank the Expo for their hospitality and coordination. This was truly a team effort. Fortunately, the site didn't get much use, uh, but given what, given what we saw happening in other states, it was important for us to be prepared, and we were. Next, many of, uh, many of you will be celebrating Independence Day this weekend, and this year it has an even greater meaning than usual. After 16 long and difficult months dealing with a once-in-a-century crisis, and all that came with it this 4th of July weekend, vaccinated Vermonters can feel safe celebrating with their friends, attending parades and cookouts, firework displays, heading to the lake or state park, or doing just about anything you'd like without having to fear the virus. Why? Because vaccines work. And we're the most vaccinated state in America, as well as the most vaccinated places on the planet. We also know those who are fully vaccinated are protected from the Delta variant we've heard so much about in the news recently. I just want to once again remind Vermonters, if you're fully vaccinated, we're, you're likely protected against the variants we've seen so far. You can do all the things you did before the pandemic without much risk. For younger children who aren't yet eligible, because of our high vaccination rate, it means they're more protected as well because there's less virus and transmission in the community. If Vermont had a low uh, vaccination rate, I might be saying something different, but we don't. There are some places in the country where rates are much lower, some states experiencing about half where we are. But again, we lead the nation. Almost 82% of those 12 and over have been vaccinated. And we can benefit from our good work this 4th of July weekend and beyond. We stayed united, we worked hard, and sacrificed a lot to get to this point. And although we still have much more work to do, taking some time for yourself, having some fun, and being safe is something you should take advantage of. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichak for this week's data and modeling presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Governor, and good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, it's now been two weeks since Vermont hit our 80% goal, and Vermonters are continuing to get vaccinated. Since last Tuesday, 3,600 Vermonters have started vaccination, uh, increasing the percentage of eligible Vermonters who have started vaccination to 81.9%. Also, as of today, there are now fewer than 100,000 Vermonters who are eligible for vaccination who have not yet started uh, their process. And Vermont continues to be a national leader with the highest vaccination rates in the country across all of the categories we have been tracking for some time now. And for the third straight week, Vermont has not reported a single death. And we've only reported one death over the last six weeks. And we anticipate that our fatality rates will remain uh, very low through the month of July. Vermont's hospitalization rates also remain low, although we have seen an increase over the last two weeks with our 14-day average increasing from 1.64 to 4.21. But Vermont continues to have the fewest per capita hospitalizations in the country, and we anticipate that our rates will stay very low in the weeks ahead. Our case rates have also stayed low this week as we have uh, seen 19 straight days of new daily cases being in the single digits, and we're averaging just over five new cases a day. Although our case totals are staying very low, we have seen an increase in the median age of new cases, which stood at just under 30 years old at the start of June, and now having risen to about 40 years old. This, in part, could explain the uh, slightly more uh, elevated number of cases we're seeing uh, among those in their 40s, 50s, and 60s relative to the rest of the population because all of the age groups are very low. Uh, and again, it might also uh, partly explain the uptick that we've seen in hospitalizations as well. But generally, as I mentioned, cases in all of the age groups are staying very low. Uh, and across all geographies as well. Uh, this week, we saw nine Vermont counties that did not report a single COVID-19 case. And our new case forecast also anticipates that our cases will remain very low uh, through the month of July as well. And uh, another uh, bit of good news, fortunately, the Northeast continues to see improvement this week as well with cases, hospitalizations, and fatalities all trending down. Cases this week just totaled over 4,000 for the region, uh, and once again is the lowest number we've seen since the start of the pandemic. And we've continued to closely track the COVID-19 trends following the, re the full reopenings uh, in New England. And again, those trends are favorable, and they are all moving in the right direction. When we take a look at the Northeast and compare it to the other census regions, we can see why the trends have been so good uh, here in our region. The Northeast saw the largest drop in new cases, and cases have also remained the lowest in the country. And again, you can tie this back to our very high vaccination rates. 66% of residents in the Northeast have started vaccination, compared with 53% in the West, 50% in the Midwest, and 47% in the South. And we're also seeing that the states that are the most vaccinated are also seeing fewer hospitalizations and fewer deaths as well. The governor mentioned a few of the states with lower vaccination rates that are seeing their cases rise. And when you look at the national map of how cases have moved over the last 14 days, you can see a few spots in the country uh, where cases have risen more than 20%. And particularly, in particular, Missouri, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, and then also Nevada and Utah. Again, these are states that have uh, low vaccination rates. And as we can see from the next chart, they're also states that are seeing uh, a, a relative increase in the Delta variant as well, or at least the regions in which the states are located are seeing the rise. We mentioned last week uh, that the UK has seen a rise uh, of the Delta variant in those who are unvaccinated. A couple of states now in the United States are similarly seeing this trend. And for those who are thinking about getting vaccinated, who are on the fence, it's certainly uh, something that should motivate you to go out and get vaccinated, that fewer than 100,000 Vermonters who are eligible uh, but have not yet started their process. Uh, because, as the governor said, when you're fully vaccinated, uh, you can be assured that the Delta variant uh, will not be a threat to you. And finally, taking a look at uh, Canada, north of the border, uh, the trends there have been very strong over the past week. 
67.8% of all Canadians have started vaccination, with 28.1% now being fully vaccinated. And as you can see, their cases, hospitalizations, and fatality rates have all come down quite dramatically, as has occurred in Quebec as well, which should hopefully spell good news for the eventual uh, border reopening. So at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'll start off with an update of our progress with our vaccination program, as well as announce convenient locations to, uh, to walk in and get vaccinated this week. As of this morning, as the governor mentioned, we have 81.9%, and as uh, Commissioner Pichek mentioned as well, of eligible, eligible Vermonters, 12 years old and above, have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 73.7% .7 of eligible Vermonters are fully vaccinated in this state. Let's move on to the many convenient opportunities to get vaccinated. I'll announce this week pop-ups as usual, but as I've mentioned before, most pharmacies around the state are also offering walk-in vaccinations. Ask your local pharmacist or simply walk into CVS, Hannaford Food and Drugs, Walgreens, Walmart, Price Chopper, Market 32, Rite Aid, Shaw's Supermarket, or Costco uh, to get vaccinated. Aside from the usual University of Vermont Medical Center locations at the pharmacies on the UVMMC main campus, Fannie Allen and South Prospect Street, as well as weekdays at Northwestern Medical Center Urgent Care Clinic and daily at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center Express Care. Here's what you'll find this week in the pop-up clinics. Today, June 29th, Springfield Town Library, Northfield Farmers Market, the Community Health Center of Burlington, uh, Vermont Creamery in Webstersville, Websterville, uh, Springfield Federal Qualified Health Center. Tomorrow, uh, June 30th, Gifford Medical Center in Randolph, North Country Hospital in Newport, the State House Lawn in Montpelier, Springfield Medical Care Center, uh, Community Health Centers of uh, Burlington, and the Wyndham Town Hall. On Thursday, July 1st, Northeastern Regional, uh, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital in St. Johnsbury, Waterbury Farmers Market, Ben and Jerry's in Waterbury, uh, the Community Health Center of Burlington, and on Friday, Newport Waterfront Plaza and the Community Health Centers of Burlington. Again, like I said, the pharmacies in, at UVMMC, uh, their Fannie Allen campus, as well as Southwestern and uh, Nor Northwest are open daily as well. And on weekends, uh, on Saturday, here's what we've got going. Johnson State Park uh, in the town of Johnson, Waterbury Ambulance. Uh, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road in Berlin, Waitsfield United Church of Christ, and Williamstown uh, Flea Market. On Sunday, July 4th, Waterbury Ambulance, 1311 Barry Montpelier Road in Berlin, the Warren Municipal Complex, and the Barton Fairground. So as you can see, we continue to offer many convenient opportunities to get vaccinated. And as you know, fair season is around the corner. Soon we'll be announcing more clinics at fairgrounds across the state. In addition, we will begin using a variety of vaccination strategies in the upcoming weeks. We will be moving to a 10 to 14 regional COVID resource centers where both testing and vaccinations uh, will be readily available. Each day we are qualifying and adding more primary care offices to administer vaccines and of course, we'll continue the pop-ups, but with a more strategic emphasis going to locations that have been requested and where uh, vaccinations have perhaps lagged. We will have more to say about each of these with a map that will show these locations in the next two weeks. I urge all Vermonters to avail themselves of the many opportunities to protect the, yourself and your loved ones. Right now and into the future, there will be plenty of opportunities for all Vermonters that want to get a vaccine to get a vaccine.
It is important to get as many Vermonters vaccinated to guard against variants as well as a possible resurgence of the virus in the fall. Vaccines are safe and effective. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Le uh, Levine. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine uh, for a health update. Like I haven't said Dr. Levine uh, that many times in the last year and a half. Dr. Levine. It's one syllable longer than Smith. <laughs> Uh, my comments this morning will pertain uh, to vaccine uh, and then to our health care system and health care. I do hope you're all looking forward, as the governor wished you, uh, to the coming Fourth of July weekend and celebrating all the things that we can now do together again. Remember, this is all thanks to the vaccine. It protects us. It stops the spread. It keeps us all safe. This is why, even with Vermont's high vaccination rates and very low case numbers, you're still hearing from us. You'll keep seeing clinics in your communities and vaccine available at your local pharmacy. Story after story tells us that the majority of unvaccinated people in Vermont have nothing against getting the vaccine. They've just not gotten around to it or haven't prioritized it. They may not have thought much about it, haven't found their own personal reason, or, impossible as it seems, just haven't run into it in their day-to-day -day lives. Or they may be among the last in the wait-and-see group. If that's the case, I just ask that you consider the millions of people already vaccinated safely and join the 82 percent of Vermonters who have already made the decision. Because anyone who is, vaccinated, who is not vaccinated is still at risk, as we see more contagious variants like Delta overtaking the country, as travel increases, as other parts of the country like the South and Midwest see lower vaccination rates and outbreaks of infection, it becomes even more important to protect as many people as we can. I often get questions here about vaccine boosters. So I wanted to share with you that the CDC's advisory committee discussed this recently and has not yet come to any conclusions, except that they are not currently needed, and that at least for the mRNA vaccines, the duration of immunity to current strains may be much longer than we thought, certainly past one year. So booster shots are not likely to be on the near horizon. The advisory committee also weighed in on younger children. We do not anticipate vaccine eligibility for children under 12 to be coming early in the fall at this point, but we will continue to fully monitor the CDC recommendations closely. We're already working with our pediatric providers and other partners to plan for when that time will come, both in terms of providing information for parents, as well as how best to carry out such an effort for this younger but relatively large population. As with every step of this vaccination process, the decision will come when both efficacy and safety outcome measures have been met. And finally, I'm hearing from almost half of our hospitals that they are seeing more admissions lately. These are not COVID admissions. A number of them appear to be a result of people having delayed regular health care and therefore being susceptible to more serious illness. Sicker patients mean more stays, longer stays in the hospital and more complex needs. We were very fortunate in Vermont that we were able to work with our health care system to remain open safely during the past year so that people could get back to routine medical care. Our data showed, in fact, that health care facilities were some of the safest places to be. And now, with Vermont's robust vaccination rates, they are even safer. So I strongly encourage anyone who has put off preventive care or screenings or kids' immunizations to take the opportunity to
to get caught up when you can. I recently just did that myself. And if you have any important symptoms that you've been ignoring or waiting for a better time to address, please find the time to see your provider. The sooner, the better. Let's avoid any additional negative effects of this pandemic and keep Vermonters healthy far into the future. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Start with folks in the room. Um, Governor Brenda, Secretary Smith, you, you may have seen uh, Vermont Legal Aid um, filed a class action lawsuit to stop the changing of eligibility for the um, general assistance motel hotel <coughs> program, uh, which is slated to, of course, happen on Thursday. Um, what, what do you make of, of this lawsuit, their concerns? Again, this, um, in some respects, we've been talking about uh, going back to something that was uh, uh, more realistic, I guess, after the pandemic, after the state of emergency ended. Uh, so this is no surprise to anyone. And we feel as though we have protections in place. We've taken steps uh, to make sure uh, that uh, the people are, are protected that are coming out of the program. Um, it's expanded. Uh, tremendously since pre-pandemic and actually are going to have a, um, a more expanded eligibility uh, than before. So we feel we're in a good spot. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll know more as time goes on. Um, and we had a, a number of people at the table uh, during these discussions. So, uh, Secretary Smith. Thank you, Governor. You um, actually um, captured a lot that I was going to say. DCF and uh, AHX expected legal aid uh, to file this lawsuit. They, tell, they told us they were going to do so. We've been in discussions with them for some time. I just want to sort of recap um, how we came to this agreement of what we were going to do. It wasn't, you know, a few people sitting around, one or two people sitting around in a room. We actually got a lot of people together uh, in a room through multiple meetings and with uh, advocates and with the legislature to really try to come to consensus, which we, we did, on how this program should sort of unwind from, uh, on a post-pandemic um, operation. And so DCF and AHS uh, worked with the Vermont legislature and the emergency housing work group, which included, by the way, legal aid, representatives of local housing authorities and state leaders to craft the new housing rules. Um, there, was, there was broad consensus among the work group and the legislature with that plan uh, that the work group came up with which was acceptable and desirable and which the legislature endorsed. And that plan was, we're not going back to where it was pre-pandemic. We're actually gonna expand eligibility uh, in various criteria. One of those areas was disability. There was a strict eligibility requirements in terms of disability uh, pre-pandemic. And it mostly associated with, were you receiving Social Security disability? Were you receiving veterans disability or Defense Department disability? Those were sort of the criteria. We expanded that uh, criteria to say, if you have a doctor's note that says you're disabled, we'll take that. We'll take appeals as well. We gave notice on all of these changes on April 30th. Uh, of this year to the people in the housing program. Remember, we did this in two steps. First, if you were not in the program, the eligibility requirements came into effect on June 1. If you were in the program, you were grandfathered into July, July 1. And so, you know, we, we have expanded eligibility. Just think about this in terms of what the state of Vermont did. The state of Vermont housed just about everybody that requested to be housed uh, in motels and hotels during the pandemic. We thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't have qualified uh, in pre-pandemic uh, eligibility. And then we expanded the rules um, post-pandemic. And let me just explain what that means. 
on the coldest night, and that was sort of the, um, the criteria that we used, because this program was to make sure people were sheltered during cold, whether in shelters or in motel, hotel, or escaping domestic or sexual abuse. Um, that's what this program was designed, among other things. On the coldest night of the year, we did about 300 households pre-pandemic. Right now, there will be 950 households that will be eligible under the expanded cr criteria. That's about 1,481 individuals that will stay in the program uh, as we move forward. So um, I think we've done a fairly good job. We'll defend uh, what we've done in court and uh, we'll look for the outcome as we move forward. Given the absence of a viable you know, vacant apartments to, to move to, I mean, why not? I mean, the homeless services agencies are saying, there's just no place to go. You're, they're taking some of the $2,500 and using it to suggest they go out and buy a tent. Yeah, the, the 25, remember the $2,500 is for each individual that, that uh, is given, plus there's $8,000 in stipend if you to help you with with a move and other things for a uh, new place, place. right you can many people came from friends and family that wasn't acceptable during the pandemic because you didn't want people congregating uh, congregating what we want is for those to reach out again second um, a lot of people we're not dropping services for people. We're trying to wrap services around people to help them uh, in this transition. And also we're giving them money um, to either provide them with uh, temporary housing in other places. We're expanding the shelter capacity and each day that shelter capacity expands greater and greater. In fact, we're putting in millions into expanding that uh, shelter capacity and Ultimately, as, as you mentioned, um, well, you didn't mention it, but I'll mention it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we're putting in $120 million of money to build permanent housing. That's the solution here, is building permanent housing. Uh, you know, we're expanding eligibility in these areas. We're, we're giving money for people to help during the transition. We're not you know, saying, see you later. There are other opportunities with services that we're providing. Local providers are doing their best to help out. And we are placing people uh, as we move forward. So, you know, we're going to have to work through this as we work through bringing people in to the hotel motel program uh, during the height of the pandemic. Governor, the Last week, before lawmakers left, they passed a housing bill that I think there are elements of that you were very supportive of, but there might have been some parts. I think there was an apartment registry uh, that you had some concerns about. Uh, are you going to support that bill? We haven't received the bill yet. It hasn't. Uh, we haven't gotten it from the legislature at this point in time. Um, there's some good parts of the bill, some that I, uh, I see as problematic. And I see that as uh, possibly setting us back a bit on our housing crisis. I think there are going to be some uh, who, um, who want to add an apartment or do a room or, or something in their own home um, that aren't going to do it uh, because of the registry. They're just not going to go through all the, the hoops and obstacles uh, needed to, to put yourself out there. So I see that as problematic. Uh, I think that there are a number of people who do as well. Uh, but it's up, to, uh, it's up to me, I guess, at this point uh, to weigh that out uh, because some of the, uh, the good aspects of the bill were some initiatives that we put forward, uh, VHIP and so forth, and housing improvements. Uh, it's money that we think are going to be necessary and could uh, help in, in many different ways. So again, it's going to be a close call, uh, wait for the bill. I haven't really uh, looked at it myself uh, in depth, and uh, I look forward to doing it, and then we'll have a decision, uh, make a decision within five days of receiving it. Do you find the registry to be that onerous? I do. Yeah, I think it will uh, be onerous, um, and I think in time we'll see that 
it could be problematic. Um, and I understand why uh, some uh, advocates supported it. Um, a lot of it was about market share and competitiveness in, in, other, in other industry. Um, but, uh, but I think about the, you know, the mom and pops and so forth that might, again, want to put on an, uh, add a, an apartment in their home uh, to supplement their income or, or do something different. They just might not want to um, put themselves out there um, because they're, you know, it comes with uh, costs and capital improvements and so forth. Um, and that's what it'll lead to. But we'll see. Here's the legislature did not attempt to override your veto on um, S-107, the juvenile records yeah, bill. Yeah, not have, yet. Yeah, have, have, have you and Commissioner Sherling uh, come, come to any sort of agreement as to what, what that policy should look like in the interim? No, I mean, we're going back to what we had before. Um, that's, uh, uh, there's still, it's still problematic in terms of uh, what the statute says and what we need to do. So we're, we're contemplating that, but, but at this point in time, we're just going back to what we had, uh, had been utilizing over the last few months. So the state will not be releasing names. We're still, any, any timeline as to when there will be some sort of well, policy? Well, again, it depends on what the legislature does. Um, they'll be back and whether they seek to override it or work with us uh, to provide clarity. I, I would like them to work with us and work together and provide clarity uh, and, and determine what we really want uh, to do for the future. With uh, July 1st coming up in a couple of days, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, action from this year is going into law. What, what do you see as the most important thing um, going, well, going forward from the first? Yeah, I think the, all the ARPA uh, money and uh, what that means in terms of uh, whether it's housing, uh, whether it's water, uh, sewer, broadband, and so forth, uh, I think those are the highlights uh, in a lot of respects. Question for Dr. Levine um, uh, from a couple in Essex who wrote me last night. And they're asking if you could give us a, uh, a profile of a typical person that is contracting COVID-19 now, this month, uh, or uh, is hospitalized now. Uh, age, vaccination status? Typically unvaccinated, I would imagine. And how many vaccinated people have tested positive in Vermont for the virus? So the so-called breakthrough rate, which means you've been fully vaccinated, but you've turned up as a case, is six in 10,000, which is about similar to national numbers, uh, perhaps a tiny bit higher than national numbers because I think we have better track of that data. It's a little harder for me to give you a full assessment on the hospital because we're literally going from one or two cases a day to five or six cases a day. Um, so it's a little harder to understand that one yet. The age uh, range, who's, getting, who's coming down with us now? Yeah, so the ages have been quite, um, varied from very young, like in single digits, to uh, sometimes in the 60s, often in the 30s and 40s. Again, we're dealing with you know, three to six cases a night uh, in our reports. So hard to say that's you know, statistically significant. But clearly, as uh, Commissioner Pichek showed, the age has gone up a little bit recently. Um, still not super high. Most of the time, our oldest Vermonters uh, have been very fully vaccinated because we have uh, an incredible rate of vaccine in that population. So we're not seeing many people over age 60. Dr. Levine, I just had one more question for you. Um, I think you said there were about 100,000 people who are yet to be vaccinated in the state of Vermont. A little less. And last week was about 3,600. Does that sound right? That did get vaccinated. Did get vaccinated? Yeah. 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 So that's going to take you a couple of weeks to uh, get through this group. I'm just sort of wondering internally, what have you set as a goal to say? You know, 
if we hit 85%, we're doing pretty darn well, and we ought to be happy about it. Yeah, well, you're asking a team that isn't going to tell you a magic number that we set as a goal, but the current number is not the goal. It's higher than the current number. So we are willing to take as long as it will take. Um, none of our vaccine sites are oversubscribed now. There are no waiting lines. And as you know, there's no registration process necessary. You can walk into so many sites. So we're going to keep them going, and we're going to keep allowing Vermonters, even at the rate that it's happening, even if it's 3,600, that's uh, still better than zero. Um, the goal would be, again, if everybody wants to understand this clearly, be ready for the fall and winter with fully vaccinated Vermonters because uh, if there's anything sneaky that's going to happen with this virus in the future, it's going to be when people are more congregated indoors again in a different time of year. If there are more variants on the horizon, they're not going to start in Vermont for sure because uh, the virus doesn't have much of a chance here to be passed from person to person. But the reality is uh, if we're going to encounter new and interesting variants, we need to be prepared for that. So. This is the time to really get yourself vaccinated and go through that process. All right, we will go to the phones now. And if we have any, uh, if you have any more, we can come back at the end for the folks in the room. But we'll go to Wilson Ring, the Associated Press. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, first time I've tried this technology. I hope it's working. Um, Governor, as I'm sure you know, there's been a lot of talk, and this is a question you've been asked before, but I'm ready for an update. Uh, about reopening the Canadian border and making it possible for people to cross back easier, uh, back and forth easier than they can now, which of course is very difficult. Um, New York has its Excelsior Pass or thinks they're working on it. Um, have you given any thought to uh, coming up with something like that that Vermonters could use when it's time to go to Canada other than their little cardboard cards that they could show to the uh, border people? We haven't uh, worked on anything uh, different than what we have right now. I would assume that the cards would work um, and I would advocate that people should take pictures of their card while they have them uh, at their disposal uh, to have with them. And um, I, uh, you know, again, I don't have any inside knowledge as to what's going to happen, but I would not be surprised if there wasn't some sort of uh, vaccine type of passport uh, that would be necessary to go back and forth across the border uh, when it does open. I think the, uh, the door has been open uh, somewhat in, uh, of late, and I believe that um, sometime at the end of July, we might see uh, that uh, the border will be opened up uh, to those who have been vaccinated. But, but again, that's just speculation on my part. But you don't have any ideas about how Vermont could contribute or Vermonters could uh, sign up for those passes? Well, I believe that, uh, the, for, again, I'm just uh, speculating, but I would say the vaccine card in itself uh, presented at the border would be sufficient. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Uh, thank you, uh, Jason. Uh, Governor, <clears throat> I was wondering, uh, the state uh, is going to, has been noted, going to be closing down hotel sites uh, that have been uh, provided to a lot of people at taxpayer expense uh, this week. And some of the people may not want to move out of the free housing, what what plans does the state have to remove these take, r remove these people and turn the property back uh, to the owners of these hotels and so they can rent them out or whatever they want to do with them? Um, I, I've talked to several police chiefs and they've indicated they have zero interest in handling a civil issue like landlord tenant disputes and evictions and everything like that so will the state police be doing any of this eviction enforcement in these towns or will the hotels be on their own yeah um i personally haven't uh, contemplated that there would have to be some sort of eviction process in some of the motels and hotels but uh, secretary smith might have more on that
We haven't. Um, we believe that most people will comply with um, leaving the hotel motel. We do have social workers that we will be deploying in those areas uh, that may need it if um, there are con um, uh, there are some resistance in uh, leaving the hotels. Uh, at this time, um, we haven't notified local police departments, um, and we haven't notified the state police. We hope we can resolve any of those issues uh, on a uh, ongoing basis. Mike, I just want to I, I just want to reemphasize what we did as a state, uh, which I'm pretty darn proud of, and and I'm pretty darn proud of what we're doing as a state. Uh, with those that are homeless. And I'm pretty darn proud of what we're going to do as a state. When this pandemic hit, um, we said anybody, anybody that says they're homeless, we will put in a ho hotel or a motel. Uh, we did that. Now we have to wind down that program. And we've done it in a way that expands eligibility past the, past the eligibility of what the program looked like before we uh, before we started, and we did that with a lot of collaboration as we move forward. We're going to be spending forty one million dollars. Just to give you some context, before the pandemic, we spent six million dollars in this program. We're going to be spending forty one million dollars in this program uh, for fiscal year twenty two. And then in the future, what I'm pretty darn proud of is I've never seen a housing bill that I'm seeing coming down the pike for permanent housing for individuals that are experiencing homeless. I mean, we're gonna, we have $120 million in terms of housing for next year, but it's a part of a $250 million proposal that the governor put forward. I've never seen that in my lifetime. So we, we anticipate that what we are going to do is, um, I, I, I firmly believe that everybody will be compliant, but I firmly also believe that we, we resolve these issues on a social services issue and, and perhaps not on a, uh, a public safety issue. But you've seen, you certainly must know of or seen yourself that there are evictions long before the pandemic came along. There were a lot of evictions in the court system uh, and it's just going to be some people that just don't want to leave. You know, they're happy with the, the hotel and the accommodations and everything. And and you, somebody must have been thinking, how are we going to end this? Granted, 98% may leave, but it's the 2% that you're going to be stuck with and that the hotel owner cannot reclaim his property. Yeah, Mike, I, I think what we're hoping is that we can resolve it on a social services type of um, of situation in red, in, instead of a law enforcement, um, you know we'll we'll see how it goes. But um, you know the state has been very generous. We just hope that people understand that this is an unsustainable program from twofold. One is we don't have enough hotel rooms anymore. We've lost 300 hotel rooms as we open up the economy. That's only going to continue. Uh, we had the fortunate uh, situation of having hotel rooms available, which was the unfortunate situation. It was by the pandemic that did it. Uh, but we had the, um, the, uh, un, uh, you know, the fortunate of having rooms available. We don't have those rooms available anymore. Tourism is starting to pick up. Those rooms are starting to, uh, to be occupied. And secondly, um, if we continued, I just want to put this in context, we're spending $41 million in FY22, but if we continued the program as is, it would have cost us $108 million with no guarantee that the feds would reimburse us for the full year in, in, in that amount of money. So um, social, we, we hope through social service engagement, uh, we can resolve any issues where people um, don't want to leave a hotel motel. And I think it's a little bit different than eviction um, a hotel motel um, uh, program. You know, we, we were fairly explicit that this was temporary to begin with. Okay, thanks. No, I, I fully understand it's a great job you guys put all those people up. And there's always going to be a few, though, that will take advantage of the system. Thank you very much. And, and they have the, uh, 
the ability, some of them would have the ability with a $2,500 stipend to stay longer if they'd like to, if they want to utilize that for, you know, an overnight rate. Thank you. Chris Mays, the Brattleboro Reformer. Hi, Governor. I was wondering if you can comment on the um, Ethiopian Community Development Council proposal being submitted to the federal government um, for having a center here in Brattleboro and how the state or your administration is supporting the effort for um, refugee resettlement here. Um, obviously, uh, we, uh, we highlighted this as uh, an initiative that we'd like to see expanded. Uh, we'd ask uh, for more uh, of the allotment from the federal government, and hopefully we'll be able to move forward with that. It's just uh, from every aspect, I believe, would be beneficial to Vermont. We need more people. We need more diversity, and uh, I think this is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Um, I don't know if this is for you, Governor or Dr. Levine. Uh, I noticed a, a posting from the, the Vermont National Guard, uh, specifically the Jericho Vermont uh, 3rd Battalion, that uh, being deployed. Uh, and they were talking about the fact that they had a very, very high vaccination rate. I think it was 87%, uh, which is impressive, as is Vermont. However, I was curious with Vermont's success in with the direct involvement of the National Guard, not National Guard, in uh, administering vaccinations, why wouldn't be 100%? Well, I think everyone still has a choice, uh, Tom, as to whether they it wasn't required. Uh, I think I've heard some statistics across the country uh, where, and I was surprised by this, that uh, members of the military uh, have uh, across the country uh, have been at a much lower rate than I would have expected. Um, so I think uh, having as high a rate as uh, we're seeing, uh, if 87 percent, I think that's uh, that's good news for us. Because again, let's let's be honest. There's a certain number of the population who are never going to be vaccinated, will never um, uh, want to be vaccinated, and we have to just accept that. Uh, we're not going to make it mandatory. And people have uh, have choices to make on their own, so I I think that's pretty good news. We'll continue uh, to leave uh, that option open, and uh, hopefully the other 13 percent will uh, will uh, decide to get vaccinated in the future. Dr. Levine, anything you want to add? Not, not too much to add, Governor. The um, we don't know who those 13 percent are and what specific characteristics they might have that might influence why they aren't getting vaccinated or not. Um, the reality is, as I've said before, we do not view the unvaccinated group in Vermont as vaccine resistant or totally against the notion of vaccine, very skeptical. Uh, quite often it's other factors that are much easier to meet the person where they are at and they eventually will get vaccinated. So I would consider even the 87% as the floor, and there may be more uh, coming up, getting them closer to 90 or even higher. The other thing is, as the governor said, um, at one point in the pandemic, I know that the rate of uh, uh, not getting vaccinated in the military was as much as one in three. Um, I hope that still isn't true, but let's assume it, it's close. Uh, we're certainly way ahead of that, which is great. Do you have any information why, given the fact that it would be wasted resources uh, to have soldiers coming down with COVID in the middle of their operations in any part of the world, why the United States government wouldn't make it mandatory for anybody who's in the armed forces of any branch? to be vaccinated, regardless of how they feel about it personally? Yeah. Um, again, I don't have any inside knowledge at all, and um, it's probably a better question for the Department of Defense. Um, but um, 
but I would think from a readiness standpoint, we would want as many of the, our uh, military vaccinated as possible. Um, I think this is uh, it's problematic, but uh, probably a, a better question for them. I appreciate that. Uh, one last question. Um, the, uh, the reminder that the uh, destruction of the building that collapsed in Miami and now observing that Secretary Buttigieg is uh, in New York City looking at uh, bridges and tunnels. Um, there's a great database uh, put together that in, uh, in, in Vermont uh, Transportation Department that shows the details of inspections of bridges. Uh, we don't have any tunnels, but um, I was unable to find the frequency and policy of how many times, and is there any sense given this focus on infrastructure that uh, Vermont may do more uh, inspections? You know, uh, Tom, we've done, um, we've upped our game in terms of inspections over the last couple of decades. Uh, when I was in the Senate, uh, we, we, uh, we took, uh, the initiative on and thought we had a number of structurally deficient bridges in, in our state. And that was highlighted during Irene. Um, so we decided to double our efforts and we put on more uh, manpower uh, as well as uh, equipment necessary to to make sure that we were inspecting uh, our bridges, bridges and, uh, and uh, other structures, uh, railroad and so forth uh, on a, uh, a much uh, quicker basis. Um, so I think that that, and we've, and we've again stepped up our efforts in terms of replacing uh, those structurally deficient bridges. So I think we're in, we're ahead of the, the curve here, and uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. So I don't believe that we'll need to uh, do anything more than we're doing already. Uh, but I'd be happy to, uh, to put Secretary Flynn in, in touch with you. Uh, thanks very much. I'd love to hear from you. He's always very helpful and appreciate your answer. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, Governor, we're still hearing a lot of complaints from employers about uh, people not coming back to work. This is especially acute, of course, in the tourism industry. And I'm wondering uh, what your reaction to that. A lot of the complaints are, well, people are just slumming on the sidelines taking the, the federal payout for unemployment. And what, what's your reaction to that? Yeah. Um, Obviously, we're moving in the right direction in some respects. We went from over 90,000 uh, being uh, on uh, the unemployment uh, insurance uh, um, program, and um, we're now down below 20,000. I think the last I saw, we were around 18,000, and that was all in traditional UI, PUA, and so forth. Um, so we're moving in the right direction. I think that's the, the good news. Um, there are some good aspects, and then uh, there are some concerning aspects of the $300 stipend. Uh, I think there are a certain segment of the population uh, that uh, they do the math and feel as though they can stay home, uh, collect unemployment, uh, get the $300 stipend, and be in better financial uh, shape than they were if they were working. Uh, there's also a segment of the population uh, that uh, that can't go back to work at this point and uh, and need that uh, $300 stipend. Um, this lasts until September 6, and I know this is painful uh, for many, uh, especially in the hospitality sector, in particular. But every single sector in Vermont, as you know, Tim, uh, because I'm sure you're hearing from your members, every single sector. Is, uh, is, is challenged uh, by workforce uh, needs. But again, this is no surprise. Just remember, before uh, the pandemic, pre-pandemic, we had the lowest unemployment uh, rate in the country. Uh, we also had more jobs and we had people to fill them. That hasn't changed. Uh, in fact, it's gotten worse. Remember, go back four or five years. When I first ran, I talked about 631. I talked about this uh, last week. But it's so true. We are lo losing six workers out of the workforce every single day. Six workers. So think about that. I mean, that's, that's uh, a, a couple thousand every single year. Uh, it's been four or five years. That's 10 to 12,000 people since then. Uh, we're also losing uh, kids out of the school system. Three, that was the three. Three fewer kids in, in the school system every single day. 
So when you do, uh, again, uh, you, you, th you think about that, that's another 1,000 a day. That's, that's, that's 4,000 since uh, the beginning. So again, this shouldn't come as any surprise. They, we're still challenged, and that's why I talk about uh, the needs in terms of uh, the refugee program, more immigration, trying to attract more people into the state, making Vermont more affordable, uh, so people will either stay here or come here. And then uh, utilizing what we have, uh, all the attributes we have, being the safest, healthiest state in the country, is an attribute we, we earned uh, over the last uh, 16 months. And we should take full advantage of that. Um, but as well, I, um, we should, uh, the beauty of our state, all, the, all that we have to offer, selling that, and, and again, working to make sure, uh, and, and, and I've taken a lot of criticism um, at times from the legislature, not from taxpayers, but from the legislature, on, um, on some of the vetoes I've, I've uh, imposed over the last four years. Most of them were financial, and most of them, you know, budgetary issues. We didn't need to raise taxes uh, during this time because we need to make Vermont more affordable, and we proved that we could do it without raising taxes. And that's why we have to continue uh, to march forward and make sure that we're not making uh, Vermont a more expensive place to live, but actually more affordable. And, and other things like this, the military pension, uh, for the life of me, I don't understand why we don't move forward with that. Hear from military uh, um, retirees uh, every single day uh, about, uh, you know, we're one of six states that still still taxes their military pensions. If we didn't do that, uh, they might consider staying or coming to Vermont. So we, uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there. We need to continue uh, to focus on the needs of the state, uh, but, but having more people here, having more people in the workforce is something that uh, we're challenged pre-pandemic and we're, we're certainly challenged today. But we'll, uh, <clears throat> we have to give, getting back to the original question, the stipend, the $300 stipend, will end the 6th of September. We have to give 30-day uh, notice. Uh, whatever we do, uh, I think we should see this through. But but I would say this: if uh, if Congress decides to extend the $300 stipend, uh, I would uh, be um, I, I would probably not accept. I, I think it's gone on long enough, <clears throat> and we would let it. Uh, we would let it lapse uh, as of September 6. Do you have any thoughts about perhaps this is, we're seeing a sea change in how people are, are entering the workforce, that maybe even all things being uh, equal, that they would not come back to these type of hospitality jobs? There's some, there's some discussion about that right now that, that maybe we've seen a, a change in the, uh, in the overall economy and workforce. I'm, I suppose uh, that could be, um, but um, but everything has a way of leveling itself out. I know that the um, those uh, those uh, business owners in those sectors uh, are doing their part. They're offering more money uh, for people to come in, higher wages, uh, something far exceeding uh, the fifteen dollar minimum wage that uh, many advocates had uh, proposed. And uh, I think that, again, it's about supply and demand. So uh, I, I believe that employers know uh, they have to offer uh, more benefits, more um, higher wages in order to keep and to attract more people, and they're doing that. So we'll see how this all levels out. I think it's a little too soon at this point to, to determine what the future is going to bring. Um, I think we're, we're just going to need a little bit more time, maybe even with um, some of the uh, students coming back in the colleges and universities uh, seeking part-time jobs, uh, that will help as well, something that they might not have been able to do uh, in the uh, previous uh, 16 months. Uh, but when they come back in the fall uh, and maybe sooner, I think, uh, th I think we'll see that there will be more uh, that uh, may, may enter the workforce uh, as second jobs at that point. Great, thank you. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Um, this is probably a question for Dr. Levine. I heard from a reader who 
got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, that he is concerned about the fact that it seems to be only 60-some percent, 66 percent effective against the Delta variant. He wants to know if it makes sense for him to now go get either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine in Vermont. Thank you for the question. It's uh, an increasingly common question these days. The, um, the number you're quoting, again, we have to sort of dissect that a little um, in terms of is that the number just protective against getting any illness or getting more severe illness with the Delta variant? Because uh, I'm not seeing as many statistics on Johnson & Johnson as I've seen on AstraZeneca or the mRNA vaccine. Most of the time when you get a number like that, it's uh, just getting sick at all. Uh, and the vaccine turns out to be a lot better at preventing the more serious end of the spectrum of illness. But there is, you know, already known that the Johnson & Johnson efficacy rate, forgetting the strain, just coronavirus in general, uh, from the get-go was lower uh, than the mRNA vaccines. But having said that, we still believe and did believe then that it was still quite effective against the serious end of the illness spectrum, including hospitalizations and deaths. So that needs to be taken into account. The second thing that needs to be taken into account is um, the, the rate of vaccination and the status of the virus in Vermont right now. Because even if the Delta variant is flaring up in Missouri and in Arkansas and other states, where there are very large pockets of unvaccinated people, if some of those chose to take a vacation in Vermont, that virus was not going to be transmitted very readily to Vermonters or to other people because it'll reach a dead end, most of the people being vaccinated. So keep that in mind as we talk about this. What I've begun to think about is that if you're actually planning on staying in Vermont and you're not going to be traveling anywhere, um, it doesn't really matter which vaccine you got right now. They all are showing efficacy against the Delta variant. And we have such a very low rate of community transmission of virus now that you're going to be protected and safe. If you're planning on taking an extended vacation to a state where the rates are much higher now and where not the rates of vaccination, them being lower, but the rates of cases being higher, um, and you want to have the most uh, insurance against protection, you might consider getting a dose of vaccine, whether it be another dose of the same or an mRNA. The problem with that is we don't have scientific evidence right now to support any particular strategy. There are studies that are ongoing, and some have been recently starting to report some data on the more mix and match approach of vaccine use. Getting a first dose of one type of vaccine, a second dose of another type of vaccine. And um, it's very hard for someone in the medical profession to give you firm assurance that the approach you're choosing is going to be correct or not. But having said that, there is an element of what we term in medicine clinical judgment here to think about. And if you're going to be uh, exposing yourself to a place that has a lot of transmission of virus going on, uh, I don't think anybody would uh, say you were being overly cautious by thinking about getting another dose of vaccine. But I don't want to throw J&J &J under the bus by any means because, again, we do stand by the fact that it is effective. It's effective uh, against being very severely ill. Uh, much, to, much to the same degree as the other vaccines that have been in use. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for that awesomely scientific answer. Now, a process question along those same lines. What would the process be in Vermont if our reader wanted to go to one of these clinics and get a Pfizer vaccine? Is it allowed? Yeah, so that's when I would begin to talk with your own uh, health care provider. Um, because that would be the right way to get an informed um, piece of advice and decision on that. That provider might also be in the uh, position, because we've enrolled so many primary care sites now, to be able to provide the vaccine. And uh, that would, I think, take care of the sort of 
being informed part, having an informed consent process, if you will, because you've both thought it through very carefully. And then if you chose to get the vaccine, you could get it at that site as well. Got it. And would that, those supplemental doses be free as your first shot was? All the vaccines are free at this point in time, so I'm not aware that anybody would be charged for anything. Great. Thank you very much. Greg Lamoureux, the county courier. Let me just go, go to Lisa for just a minute. Um, as someone who got the vaccine, the Johnson Johnson vaccine myself, I'll be paying close attention to this as well and uh, listen to the science, the data. Uh, and I have to believe that Johnson Johnson is probably doing some trials on their own on this as we speak. So I feel very well protected at this point, but uh, I'll be paying attention to this as well. Thank you. Greg Lamro. Thank you, Jason. Um, the question that I've prepared has already been asked, and uh, my follow-up, I, I think I'm not quite prepared for. So I will uh, touch base with Dr. Levine off there. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Ann Allen, seven days. Um, hi. I wanted to follow up on uh, Tim McQuiston's question a little about employment and just ask, um, if people refuse to be vaccinated and they work somewhere that requires it, um, they will lose their job. Will they uh, receive unemployment? I don't have the answer to that one. Um, that may be a Commissioner Harrington question, if he has the answer. Yeah, Governor, I think uh, appreciate that and appreciate the question. Um, I think as we've said before, it's kind of a uh, moving target, if you will, or just uncharted territory. Um, so I think we've been encouraging uh, employers to speak with their own legal counsel uh, to get uh, their their attorney's perspective on that. Um, the, the fact of the matter is when it comes to uh, uh, collecting unemployment benefits, uh, either someone is let go for cause or they have quit their position, um, you know, and, and that would mean that they would not get benefits if they were simply let go, but not for cause, um, then they would be eligible for benefits. Um, and that's a very uh, layman's uh, description there. But I think in this case, it really comes down to the question of whether or not dismissing somebody for not getting the vaccine um, would be considered for cause or not. And I think that's where it will probably play out uh, in the court system that people across the country um, probably are tackling this and appealing decisions uh, and outcomes. Um, but again, I think that would be that would be a discussion that employers should be having with um, with their own legal counsel. Um, okay, thanks. And I also had a question uh, for Secretary Curley, if she's there. I wanted to ask um, how the hospitality industry is doing. We're definitely hearing, of course, that they can't find staff, and that's actually suppressing their economic activity. But in general, during the pandemic, has Vermont lost more hospitality businesses than it does regularly? I know it's a fluid industry, and businesses come and go. I'm talking about inns and restaurants and attractions. Do you expect more than the usual rate of closures and attrition this year for these usually small businesses? Um, thank you for the question. I, I honestly don't have a, an answer on it. I hope that we're not going to see more than usual. Um, I know it's been a really tough year. I've heard from many um, owners of hospitality businesses that they are struggling to, to find workers, but as the governor mentioned, we're seeing the number of people on our unemployment come down, but we, <laughs> we've had a, a long-standing challenge um, with our demographics in terms of our aging population. So the crisis has exacerbated our struggle in that area, and we do worry about people who may have worked in that industry who were at or close to retirement age or really didn't necessarily um, need to have a job for a variety of reasons, but, but like to have a job who may have decided to step out of the workforce. So that's a bit alarming to all of us as well, um, but we can see how it can happen. So it's hard to, to really, you know, 
tell at this point whether we're going to see more more hospitality businesses leave um, or, or you know not be able to stay open going forward we're going to keep a close eye on that um, we are tourism commissioner talks regularly with with the sector and um, we're going to try to keep a, a pulse on what's going on and we're going to try to find creative ways to help them get their workforce find their workforce and um, it's, it's a long-term proposition but we're all in it together and uh, hopefully hopefully positive things will happen um, great thank you I, I just have one more quick question uh, you guys have given us a projection of continued very very low cases through August what about um, after August what about the fall is there any way of knowing what's going to happen or if anything's going to change in Vermont in the fall you know, we've talked about this a, a bit, and uh, Dr. Levine might be able to expand upon it, but uh, my feeling is we're going to see, as we move inside, we're going to see maybe an uptick in cases, um, but those who are vaccinated will be uh, protected uh, from that, and I don't expect we'll see anything near what we have in the past, but I just think from a natural uh, evolution that we'll see uh, more cases, much like the flu season. Uh, where there's increased cases as we get to certain periods of the uh, time of year. So I would expect that to happen as well. Dr. Levine? Uh, do you expect any restrictions? No. And, and, and that's what I would agree with that, you know, it, it, that's why we're really trying to encourage anyone who's unvaccinated to really um, make it a priority. Be prepared for the fall, which, you know, here we are, we're just about in July, but if you think about it, uh, it's a six to eight week process uh, to be fully vaccinated. So this is not too late, this is perfect timing, and um, we encourage that. Uh, much of the answer to your question really relates to the status of the virus in general in the country and in the world. So. Uh, when you're talking about making projections for three or four months ahead of time, it's really challenging because what's going to happen with the Delta variant in the United States? It's starting to play out now, but we have to wait and see how it fully plays out. We have much of the world that still has very low vaccination rates, and the Delta variant, you'll recall, came from India, uh, and um, they had a major, major crisis in India with the virus. Will another part of the world have that crisis or will things simmer down? It's very hard to really uh, predict all of those events and they play into the answer you're asking for. But, you know, if, with regard to restrictions in Vermont, again, with a very highly vaccinated population, um, we should not need to have restrictions um, on uh, anything that anything close to what we were doing throughout managing the pandemic to date. All right, thank you so much. And if I could just, I just want to go back to your previous questions. Uh, uh, one, uh, I just want to highlight the fact that I think we would see more businesses, particularly in the hospitality sector, uh, that would be closed today if not for all of the work that the uh, Secretary Curley and her team uh, performed over the last uh, number of months advocating for more uh, corona or, um, uh, virus relief funds uh, going to uh, the business community uh, and as well um, Senator Leahy, uh, Senator uh, Sanders, Congressman Welch advocating for more uh, dollars from the federal government uh, to, to supplement uh, the income loss of these businesses. I think we would see a, a very, very stark difference had it not been for that and those efforts. So uh, again, we, I just want to make sure that we remember uh, that uh, this all worked because of all those efforts. Uh, in terms of uh, those who are displaced, uh, if they don't get vaccinated, I just want to remind everyone we there's a lot of opportunity in Vermont in terms of employment. I think I saw a figure of uh, for every one person unemployed, there are five uh, jobs available. Um, so uh, it, you shouldn't be unemployed for very long if you choose uh, not to work for a company that uh, mandates vaccinations. All right, thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Thank you. 
Governor, Commissioner Levine said today, anyone who's not vaccinated is still at risk and that relatively few Vermonters are vaccine resistant. I personally know dozens, maybe even hundreds of vaccine, quote unquote, vaccine resistant Vermonters who are concerned about long-term health risks of vaccination and are pursuing other means of protection. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if in addition to vaccination, would you or Commissioner Levine also publicly advocate for non-vaccine therapies such as ivermectin or um, hydroxychloroquine? I, uh, that's probably above my pay grade at this point. I, I know vaccines work. Um, I've had one, I was vaccinating myself. I don't know if you were a guy or not, uh, but, um, but I go to where the numbers are. The data and the science shows me that vaccines are effective, they're safe, uh, and, uh, and we've seen how we benefited uh, in the state as a result. So I'll keep going back to that, but I'll let uh, Dr. Levine weigh in on the other. Thanks, Governor. Um, with regard to the first part, the, um, we're not just saying there aren't that many Vermonters who are totally resistant to getting the vaccine. Uh, we're using some national survey data. We're using some New York Times data uh, to try to put that together as best we can. But it does seem like Vermont, in stark comparison to many other states, does have a much lower percentage of people who would fall in the vaccine skeptic, vaccine resistant category. Doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, perhaps the circles you're in, you know more of them than the average Vermonter might know. But either way, uh, statistically speaking across the state, uh, it's certainly not the big portion of the 90 to 100,000 we were talking about earlier. Um, with regard to these therapies, uh, these drugs are used both in therapy, meaning treatment for someone who chose to be unvaccinated and got, became a case, versus trying to prevent uh, becoming a case at all. I don't really want to comment on hydroxychloroquine at all because I think that has been really discarded and that the risk-benefit ratio is markedly in favor of risk, not benefit. With regard to ivermectin, I do believe that there is some data out there. The problem is um, most of the data out there is anecdotal or comes from smaller studies. When you start looking at some of the clinical trials that have been performed, it doesn't fare as well. And specifically in the uh, situation of prevention as opposed to treatment. Uh, it's certainly not been embraced by most of the treatment community, though there are notable exceptions that are very prominent on the internet. Um, but from the evidence-based medicine scientific community, uh, it has not fared as well, especially in the area of prevention. If I were uh, a Vermonter who was trying to weigh the potential risks and benefits of getting a vaccine, versus taking uh, a drug that, um, frankly, a drug that hasn't had a lot of utility in uh, human treatments in the past, uh, in a very select way it has, uh, I would choose the vaccine because we now have much more than we ever get from clinical trials of drugs. We have millions and millions of people experience, and we know uh, that the benefit risk ratio is way weighted towards benefit. Thank you. Xander Landon, Vermont Digger. Hi, can you hear me? We can. I have a question for Secretary Smith, um, and it's about the lawsuit, um, the legal aid lawsuit. Uh, legal aid says that the rule change for the housing, the GA housing program isn't legally valid and didn't go through the correct uh, legislative approval process. They also say that the definition, the administration's definition of what qualifies as a disability is too restrictive. Uh, I just wanted to get your response to those arguments. Obviously, we disagree uh, with legal aid's interpretation of uh, the process. We think we, as I mentioned, that we went 
through the proper process. We'll deal with that in court with legal aid uh, as we move forward. And as I had mentioned before, the disability uh, definition has been expanded uh, from the pre-pandemic, uh, the old rules, to the new rules that uh, we put together. And again, I want to remind people, this wasn't sort of brainstormed in a room uh, with just a few people. You know, we put together a, a working group that had uh, legal aid in it, local housing authority, state leaders, and uh, worked with the legislature and this work group to pass uh, this compromise. Legal aid also says that there was no notice. Notice went out April 30th. So we'll we'll um, we'll defend ourselves in the in the uh, in court. We think we're on solid ground uh, as we move forward, and and by the way, we do have appeal processes in place. Uh, once notification went out, there were appeal processes that were put into place. And secondly, um, there are still appeal processes if you feel that you have been. Um, disadvantaged, uh, there is an appeal process in this. And so I think, you know, the bottom line is um, we'll, uh, we'll see legal aid in court. Uh, they also mentioned that FEMA would likely continue to reimburse uh, for this program if it was to continue at the current capacity. Um, I was just wondering, what is the breakdown of FEMA funding versus state funding for the program up until this point um, it's, you know, throughout the, the pandemic. Yeah, the, the, the vast majority is FEMA funded, a vast majority, maybe almost completely FEMA funded. It would be, if it continued, you know, we would try to do FEMA funding uh, up until the point uh, that FEMA funding went away, but I would argue um, FEMA funding isn't gonna last forever. Thanks. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Good, good afternoon. I guess I was on mute. I'm sorry. I have no questions. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Andrew McGregor. All right, we'll try Devin Bates. Uh, my question actually after I'm up at two. Thank you. And Michael Doherty, Vermont Digger. Andrew, I think I saw your uh, mic come off mute, so we can try you again. All right, and we'll try last call for Michael Doherty from Digger. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Thank you all very much, and uh, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>